Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you today. This is Tim Boland from the Poly Hill Arboretum. And we're starting a new webinar series on small flowering trees, and we'll be presenting these over the next several months. We're so very happy that you can join us today. I'm thinking of you, your family, and your extended, extended family during this time, and I wish you the best. Uh, I'm going to give this webinar and do a little mix of plants and people because it's really the people within this story that bring red buds to us in our gardens. So uh, let's get started and here we go. The red bud that we know the most about and the one that's most frequently cultivated is the eastern flowering red bud, which you see pictured here in its zone, in its map, Circus canadensis. And when you look at it, it has an extensive range all the way up to the lower half of the lower peninsula of Michigan, down into the panhandle of Florida, and then extending out into Oklahoma and Texas and even down into Mexico. Why that matters is, is that we always talk about a species, we think of the provenance, the origin or place of origin, where that plant originates from, because with it, it brings a whole evolutionary past history, which includes adaptability, hardiness, and so many things that are important to know when you're cultivating a plant. In terms of eastern flowering redbud, with this extensive range, we can see that plants out in Texas and Oklahoma actually change in their characteristics of their foliage primarily. They're more drought tolerant. The foliage itself is very shiny and waxy, which is a sign of drought tolerance. So hybridists and other horticulturists have recognized that trait and used it in the development of new varieties of redbud. In general though, when we look at Circus canadensis, we have a, a hardiness of zone four and above USDA zone four, negative 25 or so. So it's a plant that's well adapted to cold regions. If we look at red buds worldwide, there's 10 species worldwide. And this is a, a beautiful scan uh, from somebody I met in preparation of this webinar uh, from Israel. And that's not uh, shared with me the permission to use this beautiful scan of the Mediterranean Circus. And the Mediterranean Circus isn't commonly cultivated in North America. However, Circus chinensis is. So when we look at the distribution, North America, Europe, and Asia, uh, we see 10 species. It is important to note that there is a separate species in California called Circus occidentalis. My own journey with red buds is, includes the fact that I actually was the very first plant tree that I planted in my life. My grandfather was an avid gardener, as was my mother, and my grandfather would travel to Virginia every April with my grandmother to visit my aunt. In, down in and around Monticello and throughout the mid-Atlantic, this is a very common scene as you look off the side of the road or go through the woodlands. And that is a combination of Cornus Florida, which is pictured here in white or kind of creamy flowers in combination with red buds, both of these blooming at the same time. He was so inspired by this scene that when he was back in Michigan and when I started to work for him on Saturday mornings, uh, around Mother's Day, he'd like to buy red buds, and then he and I would go and plant trees at his friend's house right around Mother's Day as a Mother's Day gift. Uh, and so that's kind of my legacy starting with red buds, and it's a tradition that I still carry forth in friends' gardens. I just show up with a tree. Usually they trust that I know what I'm doing. Um, but it's a great tradition and it's something that got me into red buds very early on. My mother plays a role in what I call red bud warriors, people who have helped the cultivation of red buds through time. My grandpa was the first one I knew. Um, I planted a tree when I was 14 years old at my mother's house in Grand Rapids. And one thing for you to know, um, maybe one of the limiting factors for red buds is that they're not long live trees. They live 
hard die young. Uh, in fact, they last between 30 and 50 years of age, so they're not an oak tree. They're not other types of trees that have more longevity. So the tree that I originally planted at 14 years of age had succumbed, and I planted another one when I was a curator at the Morton Arboretum in Lyle, Illinois, one of my favorite places. Chris Bachtel, the director of horticulture, showed me a tree that had arrived spontaneously on the grounds. In fact, it was in a woodland and had the unique character of a purple pod. And I hope you can see this. Here's the pods over here. And so we called it purple pod. Then after a while, it turns out uh, that it uh, had been lost to cultivation. I was given a tree by Chris, planted it at my mother's house, and years later, I sent a picture of these deep cerise flowers, which you see here. And he said, my God, I, we don't have that tree at all anymore and we need it back. And so I called my mother, I was actually living here in Massachusetts, and she uh, dutifully followed my instructions of cutting the very foot-long branches at the end in August, uh, stripping the leaves off, wrapping them in uh, new newspaper and wet paper towels, and overnighting them to a nurseryman in Tennessee, who I'll talk about later. So this plant is in the trade still. It's called Circus canadensis morton, Joy's Pride, named after Joy Morton, the founder of the Arboretum. Let's look at redbud though in its characteristics botanically, which are really kind of interesting. I'll go and point over to your, to your left here and circle around conservation status. And it turns out that the redbud has least concern. Uh, why I say that is because of its extensive range, but as horticulturists, as horticultural conservationists and plant conservationists, you may not know this, but 20% of plants in the world are in some status of endangerment and that grows yearly, even daily because of the vagaries of habitat destruction and climate change. Redbud is in very good shape. Let's look at it though. Here are the beautiful lavender blooms of redbud. And you can see down here, the individual flowers, which I'll talk about in a moment. One of the curious things that red buds do is they have a floral morphology tendency to coliflory, and it's pictured here, the ability not only to flower out of the stem axis, but also to flower right out of the bark and right out of the secondary growth and wood. So to the right here, you see the Mediterranean cirsus exhibiting coliflory to the extreme. This is primarily um, a tropical plant feature, but it's featured here in temperate Circus. When we look at the flower though, which is really the drawing card for red buds, you can see this structure down here. This is the calyx or the sepals, which are very colorful. They appear first and are very showy. They conceal the other petals. The other petals are five total. You have two on the outside called the banner, and then you, you have, or I'm sorry, the banner, the central one, and then the two on the outside called the wings. Down below though, which is very interesting, is the keel, which are two flower petals that are somewhat fused. And if you peel those back, you'll see where the honeybees or bees, native bees go in general, down into this protective area to get the nectar. And when they go down there, there's hairs down here that cause the pollen to stick. As they leave, you can see in this portion of the flower, the stigma, the female portion of the flower, that is fertilized and lo and behold, it starts to develop the classic, what we call pea pod of the legume family. And within that, these tiny little seeds develop. Now, we like botany, in fact, we love it, and we like to talk about the interrelationships of plants and how plants are related. You know, in your neighborhood or your neck of the woods, you probably have black locusts, which is very similar with its flower, the wisteria vine, the peas we plant in the garden, and then the native groundnut throughout Northeastern North America that has this unique flower and feature. As far as redbuds and their uh, diversity, particularly of cultivated varieties, 
over the last 30 to 40 years, many, many new varieties have come into play, mainly for the reason uh, that the Arboretum itself, Polly Hill, came into play by having people like Polly Hill observe, discover, and then share. So these plants that have come through the nursery trade are from people focused on plants with a passion. As far as red buds to choose from, they're based on floral color, leaf color, variegated leaves, which I'll talk about in a moment, pod color, which you've already witnessed, and then more recently, weeping forms or dwarf forms. Uh, as gardens have developed and they've gotten smaller, like patio gardens and things, modern gardens have demanded uh, smaller trees and some of these new red buds with these interesting forms fit perfectly in that type of design. How do they come about? Well, they come about by chance or spontaneous seedlings. You might find in the forest, the lavender blooms of a grove of red buds and then there's one strange tree that has white flowers. So spontaneous seedlings are one of the many ways that we find new varieties or cultivated varieties of red bud. And then there are scientists that look at and select hybrid traits. Maybe they look at a white flowering form and they see a dwarf flowering tree and they mix those two together by hand pollination. And then there's mutations. When you look at most of the variegated leaves or different floral or leaf colors of uh, trees, they generally are mutations. In any case, all of these won't come true from seed necessarily, but in fact they are cloned. And the clonal types are reprodu reproduced by vegetative cuttings or grafting. Grafting I'll go through in a moment, but grafting is the primary way that trees are selected for a certain trait. How do you grow a red bud? I'll talk about this now and then at the end of this webinar. In general, they're hardy to zone four to eight, depending on their place of origin, which I mentioned earlier. On Martha's Vineyard, for this Vineyard Gardeners, we know that it's zone 7A, zero to five degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Since my, I've been here, which is oh, six, 17 years now, we were at zone 6A, so the climate is warming. Uh, height of the trees, depending on the variety, but the straight species is 20 to 30 feet. The spread is wider than it is tall. Bloom time typically averages from April to May, depending on the cultivated variety. The typical flower color is lavender pink. In terms of how much exposure you give these plants, they need full sun to part shade. And when I say that, four hours to six hours of sun really helps produce a vigorous flowering plant. This is a key critical factor. They like water, obviously, and we should water them in drought periods, but they have medium water needs. That is, they're not that greedy. In fact, don't overwater them or place them in low areas where water congregates because they don't like anaerobic soils or soggy soils. In fact, that's a death nail for red buds. Here on Martha's Vineyard, and this depends on where you live, you should have your soil tested. Lime applications are frequent for me in my garden. In fact, I hardly put any nitrogen down at all. In my garden, in a lot of Martha's Vineyard, the soil is 4.5, even less than that, which means extremely acidic. So lime, powdered lime, put down right now is uh, a very valuable thing for red bud culture. Let's look at another red bud warrior and the people behind red buds. And one of them is Harold Neubauer, who's pictured here at Hidden Hollow Nursery. And I've known Harold for 30 years. U.S. nurseries are actually the distribution points of plants. They are key to uh, propagating and distributing these plants. But where do they come from? Honestly, where do these plants come from? They come from Arboretum Botanic Gardens. I like to point out two here, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum in Raleigh, North Carolina, a superb collection of plants, the founder, J.C. Ralston, one of the great plant people of all time, somebody who was my mentor and several people's mentor, a phenomenal guy who got involved with red buds very early. The J.C. Ralston Arboretum has the Plant Collection Network uh, 
collection of CIRSIS, an, an amazing collection, and that's administered by the American Public Garden Association. That particular program, the Plant Collection Network, and you can go to the APGA to learn more about it. Uh, we are, Polly Hill Arboretum, the holders of the Stewardia Collections, co-holders with the Arnold Arboretum. North Carolina State and the J.C. Ralston Arboretum have played a huge part in the popularity and distribution of red buds. And another person to point out is Professor Emeritus Dr. Dennis Werner, who had done a lot of hybridizing. The U.S. National Arboretum has an outstanding collection of red buds and also does red bud breeding. And then Harold, who's pictured here, is one of the leading proponents and grafters of red buds. Well, how does grafting work? I think this is fascinating for people. Maybe you're new to horticulture, most of you are not. Here's a picture of Harold uh, with uh, an article on how he grafts these trees. If you look up here in the right-hand corner, how does it start? It starts with seedlings of redbud, just straight Circus canadensis. And what they do in August is to go down this row take the cultivated variety that they want to propagate. Let's look at one in particular. The one that Harold's holding here is called Hearts of Gold. So what they do is they'll take a singular bud, sometimes they call it a shield bud, cut it with a grafting knife. Then they'll go over to the stock plants, which you see here, and at the base of the stock plant, they'll create a fold-in cut with a little pocket They'll take that singular bud, a vegetative bud that they've cut from the scion or the selective variety, and then on the rootstock, they'll tuck it in and then cover it with paraffin wax. And over about a four to five month period, you'll see this tiny little chip bud, that's the name of the grafting technique, placed in this pocket. The vascular systems of these two things need to connect to each other. So you have nutrient and water connectivity. The following spring, it seems cruel, cruel to be kind, they'll cut this on an angle and they'll allow that tree to sprout out and grow very vigorously. That tree eventually will be dug as a bare root plant and sent to a nursery to be sold. So that's how a lot of our flowering trees are actually produced. What's curious to me about it, when you look at a cherry tree, or you look at a red bud, or you look at a fruit tree, or most of your street trees throughout North America, throughout our municipalities, they're actually two genetic individuals. The rootstock, the main thing that that's there for is anchoring in the ground and giving that plant a start and then providing the water and the nutrients over time. So the rootstocks are, are usually from wild plants. Why go through all this trouble? Well, it turns out beyond the ecological role these beautiful plants play in our natural areas and throughout, um, even in our gardens as helpful pollinator plants, they're a significant crop. From the American Society of Hort Science, a, a census that was done is, uh, it turns out that the census revealed that it's the fifth most valuable deciduous flowering tree crop in the United States a total value of $26.7 million. Think of that, the seventh most commonly grown flowering deciduous tree in the United States, almost a million grown annually. Well, they come in just an amazing array of variety, particularly the flowers and the foliage. And here's just a snapshot of some of the plants that we're going to talk about. We'll start to look at some of the standard bears, the plants that were initially introduced and dominated the trade for several years. And then we'll look at some new varieties. There's nearly a hundred now. And for your sake, in the sake of everybody, we're not going to go through all of them today. Appalachian Red uh, is one that is a, my, one of my favorites and one that was introduced quite a long time ago. Uh, in fact, it was published by J.C. Ralston in 1990, but it comes from Maryland originally and was introduced by Harold Neubauer. Why it's different is the Appalachian Red actually has these neon pink flowers. I just want to say I see some people asking questions. What we're going to do is uh, 
put a uh, link at the end, info at Poly Hill Arboretum for you to send questions because there'll be many and our time is short here today. So bear with us. This particular plant is still very popular in the trade. It grew in Michigan where I'm from, very cold. Uh, Appalachian red, mostly pink is one of my favorites. Here it is against a blue sky at the Missouri Botanic Garden, superb plant. Here it is with a little bit of shade and you can see the banner, the keel, the calyx, uh, very, very beautiful. One of the things about red buds, which you notice they flower before the foliage emerges. So that's, that's one of the other things that brings them uh, such great beauty. One of my favorites, and I mentioned earlier how spontaneous seedlings arrive, is Royal White, which was found in Parent Bluff, Illinois by the famous plantsman, Dr. J.C. McDaniel. This was also published by J.C. Ralston and brought into the trade. It is notable for its larger flowers, larger than the typical species and this beautiful pure white. J.C. McDaniel was uh, Michael Durr's mentor. Michael Durr, one of the great woody plants people of our time. J.C. McDaniel was also notable for pawpaw research as well as probably as his most famous introduction was the Annabelle hydrangea, hydrangea arborescens, Annabelle, which he also found in the wild. It's really beautiful, planted in groves. Here's a series of five trees planted at the Missouri Botanic Garden. Just, just beautiful. There are other variants. This particular one, Pauline lily, is a pale pink form and this particular plant uh, was selected in West Virginia, where it was discovered in the wild and also introduced by Harold Neubauer. This is Pauline Lilly. There are selections that are based on foliage color. There are many, many, many of them. And I don't know them all personally, but I'm gonna talk about a few that I have seen and I've seen in other people's gardens that do quite well. Let's look at some of these. So the standard bear in one of the earliest, 1947, is Circus canadensis forest pansy, the very first dark foliage form. The foliage emerges this kind of maroon color, but very shiny and glossy. What happens over time, it, the leaves turn to kind of a spinach green, this effect lasts for about a month and then it turns over as the heat comes on. The uh, flowers are very similar to the wild type rosy magenta. Uh, forest pansy has been uh, kind of a staple in the nursery trade. One that has kind of come on the scene for the most part uh, more recently is uh, a plant that's supposedly more heat tolerant. It, it's because of that, what I talked about earlier, it brings in some of the Texas Circus canadensis genes. And this was uh, produced by Dennis Werner and Lane Snelling at North Carolina State University. I have seen this, it has a thick wax on the leaf. And I mentioned that is an adaptation to drought tolerance. It's called Merlot. It's a very, very be beautiful plant that I saw uh, J.C. Ralston Arboretum years ago. One that I had to get used to be because I'm not really a, a colored foliage person, but I have to say this one grew on me. This is Hearts of Gold. Oops, sorry. Hearts of Gold uh, is a vigorous tree. In and of itself, what it does is it emerges kind of a greeny yellow and then chartreuse. It goes into chartreuse and then over time it turns a yellowish green. It's a super vigorous plant. I was surprised. It's discovered by John Rothling in North Carolina. Probably, uh, probably mutation that's been grafted. Hearts of Gold has been a popular seller and one that people really, really like. One that I was surprised we grew it last year uh, to find with this interesting new growth is got a funky name, JN2, a cultivar name. It's trademark though, the rising sun. It's a red bud with orange to yellow foliage with green speckles. This is what it does when the new leaf emerges, brilliant orange color. 
uh, incredible, incredible color. Variegation I talked about when you have spotted leaves. This one's called floating clouds. This is another recent introduction. I haven't grown it, but I believe it's, uh, do, it's going to be popular over time. White water, as you see to the right, is one of the new forms. I mentioned the breeders will take a tree and they'll find this, this weeping habit and then they'll graft a tree. And here you have white water, very beautiful kind of cascading foliage. One I really, really like, probably one of my new favorites is Ruby Falls. This appears to have some of that Western redbud in it, I should say Texas redbud in it with glossy leaves, very vigorous, produced as a standard as you see here. Ruby Falls is another one that will become popular over time. Now we've talked about Eastern redbud primarily, but it's good to also include the fact that uh, the Chinese redbud has had work done on it for several years, a lot of it at the National Arboretum. Comparatively to our Eastern flowering redbud, this has more flowers on it, a very floriferous habit. It's a little bit more stiff, it's upright, so it's, you know, it's not as graceful as the Eastern flowering redbud, and it's not as hardy either. So it's hardy to USDA zone six, nine, but worth growing. Here is probably the most famous introduction on your left, the pink form of Egoff, Circus chinensis Egoff, actually produced in New Zealand and has become popular in the trade. I mentioned the uh, floral effect of coliflory. These, these, this species has it in, in numbers. Shirabana is a white flowered form. This is a picture from the Duke Botanic Gardens and uh, just beautiful on a uh, sunny day. Shirabana is another beautiful cultivar of Circus chinensis. Well, getting back to you have a red, but how do you grow it? So from my experience, you need to protect them from strong winds. They're, they're not wimpy plants, but they just don't like to be sandblasted. So plant a tree too with uh, at least four to six hours of sun. That's important for vigorous growth and more flowering. I like to see plants go in at smaller sizes. Um, you got to have patience like Poly Hill. In fact, the smaller the tree that you put in, the more quickly it will adapt to its surroundings and grow more vigorously than a large tree. So have some faith, plant smaller trees, watch them thrive, and you'll be surprised. They'll even out surpass a larger tree that plants, that you plant and it sits for a while. Uh, the smaller trees are better in terms of maintenance and overall vigor. Vineyard gardeners, I would say because of our sandy soils with very limited organic matter, you could backfill the hole with organic matter. This does a few things. It adds more nutrients and also more moisture holding capacity to the hole and the soil. All trees mulch. Mulch your trees to conserve water and eliminate weed competition. Keep the mulch away from the trunk. Don't have it touching the trunk. About three inches is fine for most in terms of the depth. The other thing which landscaper knows, we all know that will kill a tree, not just a red bud, but most trees, what's called lawnmower blight. When people mow up to the trunk of the tree, they hit the base of it, open it up, with a wound, a pathogen gets in, and red buds do suffer from some cankers, particularly one called Boltrospheria. And so to eliminate uh, that effect, lawnmower blight, protect the, the root system uh, and the extent of the tree with a mulching. What I do in my soils, I mentioned earlier, is top dress with lime. I like to use powdered lime instead of lime that comes in a pelletized form. Uh, I think it gives an earlier shock in the season. When do you do it? Right now. Do it today. Anyway, uh, today is the best time to do it. Uh, the next week or so while we have these rains, it's really a good time to lime if you're going to do it. Water during times of drought stress, yes, in July here, water. When you water, water your trees deeply. 
Uh, just leave a trickle of a hose. It's better to let the water seep into the soil, deep into the depths of the soil. It makes your root system extend down into the soil. I prune all my trees in the winter months. It's the easiest way to see uh, the form of a tree. The three Ds is what we talk about, dead, diseased, or dying branches. They're important to remove. Uh, I did mention the canker butrospheria. It's better to prune in the winter when the spores are not active. It's a fungus, so pruning in the winter with redbud is, uh, is a recommendation. And with redbud, because you may have canker, or you may not know it, uh, between cuts, just uh, spray your falcos with some isopropic alcohol. That usually eliminates the threat of pathogen spread. Well, I'm going to conclude here by recognizing all the redbud warriors that have contributed to this webinar, the information and photos, and, and also just uh, give a shout out to Ann Quigley, who set this all up, uh, our education membership and outreach coordinator. Uh, lots of people who are colleagues and friends who have sent photos and shared their expertise with me to put this together. So thank you to this group. I do want you to send your webinar questions to this particular website, info at polyhillarboretum.org. I also want to share with you this in terms of the varieties that are out there in their entirety. They're coalesced in a publication you can find online if you Google ICRA, Redbud, International Cultivar Registration Authority, you'll get their checklist of names. A lot of the information that I put up on the screen today comes from this site. And this will also show you the provenance of plants and tell you the hybrids and how they were made and when they were introduced. Now, a big question you may have is, wow, you made us greedy for Redbuds. Where do I get one? Uh, what you need to do is you can look online for mail order sources, but the key thing is with any nursery is uh, demand creates supply. So it often takes a nursery over a year to get a hold of these trees because they sell like hotcakes. So go to your nursery, be a pest. In fact, enlist several of your friends to be a pest. Like, didn't five other people ask for that cultivar? And anyway, doing so, they will eventually have to uh, concede to your plant demands. Uh, Polly Hill had several of these last year. We'll get some more in the future. Uh, so red buds are available, but it's, it's a demand and supply deal. I want to close by saying thank you. Uh, please visit our website. For those of you on island, thank you for your wonderful notes and thank you for so many of our members sticking with us, being supportive during these difficult times. As I mentioned before, we wish the best for you, your extended family. Remember, nature is the place for all healing. Come to the Arboretum. Plants are powerful uh, and see what beauty can do for you. 